want to show you an email that I received this week from my bank. It's an important notice, no less. Uh, in it, it's telling me that somebody's tried to log on to my bank account and they've used a, an incorrect password three times, which is pretty disconcerting. And if I don't sort this out by the 1st of June, no less, in big red letters, they're going to cancel my account. Thankfully, they've put a warm, friendly blue button at the bottom, which I can click, and if I do, it takes me here to a much more comforting site. My bank's website, it's got the logo in the top left corner there, it's got a uh, no-loss security guarantee stamp, no less, in the bottom right. And in the middle of that page, you can see where I put my login details, my username, my password, press the button and end up uh, in the back end of the bank account to sort out whatever problem it is. Except, it's a scam. It's an email sent by cyber criminals to try and extract personal information from the recipient so they can begin to build a portfolio of personal data that they can then use to steal your money, get credit in your name, and ultimately steal your identity as well. This isn't actually the bank's website. It just looks a bit like it. The cyber criminal guys have set this up so that I can put my details in. It's them that will get the password and the, and the username and not the bank. So you'd think in 2022 that most of us would be kind of alive to this rort, right? And to some extent we are. So why is this still happening? Well, from a cyber criminal's perspective, it only takes a tiny percentage of a tiny percentage of recipients to click on that email and put their personal information in, and they can get a fairly hefty payday. Cybercrime is a huge issue in Australia. There's a cybercrime reported once every seven minutes, and one in three of us, one in three, will be the victims of cybercrime at some point in our lives, which means in a room like this with an audience like this, that's about 35 to 40 people here who at some point could get a call from their bank saying, hey, you've hit your credit limit on your credit card, even though you know you've not been spending on it. That's 35 to 40 people in here who might not be able to get a mortgage or apply for a credit card because their credit rating will be so bad as a result of that cybercrime activity. It's 35 to 40 people in this room who one day might wake up to somebody pounding on the door as a bailiff tries to reclaim money that you know you don't owe. One in three. That is a higher proportion of people than will die from heart disease or cancer or stroke. Now, I know what you're thinking. What an op optimistic, upbeat start to your TEDx talk, Jamie. <laughs> and you'd be right, but don't worry. There are things that we can all do to help limit the chance of us becoming one of those statistics. And my mission today is to help us all accept and acknowledge that our personal information is our personal information. We have a duty to protect it, and we can do more. I'd like us to become human firewalls so that these cyber criminals can't access that information, and we can stay safer online. But it's really hard because, as Jackie says, we're all spending hours every day on one of these things. They're amazing. They run our lives. How many of us can genuinely say we understand how a mobile phone works these days? Do you really know when it's broadcasting your location, when it's checking into Wi-Fi hubs or cell towers? What about the apps that you use on there? There's hundreds of apps that we use every day. Can you say with your hand on heart you really know what those apps are doing, when they're sharing your location? Are they talking to other apps in the background on your phone that you don't know about? The answer is yes, they are. And what about the internet? It's an amazing thing. It's revolutionized our life. But when you press a button on your computer or your mobile phone, do you really understand where that information is going? Which servers it's passing it through? Which countries it's passing through? So it's a real challenge. And that's just your mobile phone. What about all the other connected devices we've got? Smart speakers at home. We've got fridges on Wi-Fi. My electric toothbrush now has Bluetooth for some reason. Go figure. There's a great story from America about a chain of stores over there who had a massive data breach. Huge amounts of personal information from their customers were stolen by cyber criminals, not by breaking in and getting into a computer or hacking a hard drive or the server or anything like that. They had a new air conditioning unit installed that was on the same Wi-Fi network, and nobody thought to change the password. And that's how the cyber criminals got into the network and stole all of that personal information. So there's huge opportunity for cybercrime now. There's this explosion in devices, and with that explosion in devices, there's been a huge explosion in the amount of data and information that's passing through those devices. And for a cybercriminal, that's just too attractive to ignore. 
where there is data, where there is information, there has always been people interested in undermining it, hacking it, stealing it, leveraging it. And data goes back a long way. The words from the 1600s, and ever since then, there have been people with nefarious interests who want to get access to that information. And that takes us nicely to the story of the world's first data breach on the world's oldest internet, which actually happened in the early 19th century in post-revolutionary France, which most people are quite um, interested to hear about, because people assume it was maybe in the 90s when we got email for the first time, or the 80s when the internet was invented, or even the 60s when the military were messing around connecting computers together. So let me tell you the story. It starts with these. These are maritime flags. These are two out of a set of 26. And they work in a variety of different ways. One of the ways is that, as you can see, they've each got different designs. And every design out of those 26 has a slightly different uh, message. So we've been using these for 200 years to communicate from ship to ship or ship to shore. And it works like this. This one here means help. I'm in need of some assistance, which is kind of apt for me up here on the stage today. This one here means um, I'm having trouble maneuvering, so stay away. Maybe that's apt for me as well today. So the way these would work is, if you did need assistance, you'd literally take this flag, you'd run it up your flagpole on the top of your ship, and all the people who could see it, all the other ships around, would know that that's what you were asking. There's a sort of international directory of common messages. But there are other ways to use flags to communicate, and one of them is a thing called semaphore. Sema is the Greek for message. Four is the Greek for carrier or bearer, message bearer. And it's not so much about what's on the flags that matters as to how those flags are positioned. So I tell you that there are 26 different positions that you can hold these flags in, and each of them corresponds to a particular letter of the alphabet. You can see how useful this can be to communicate a more bespoke or distinct message than just, help, I need assistance. So in the, in the 1790s, the French had this idea that they could make use of the semaphore technology to communicate messages not just from ship to shore, but across vast swathes of their country. And so they came up with this idea of semaphore towers. That's what they look like. They got rid of the flags and instead replaced them with two pivoting wooden arms on the top, and they always built these on hills or the, you know, the top of towns. If you had a message that you wanted to communicate, you'd write it down, take it to a dude in the top of the semaphore tower who would use handles and winches to reposition those wooden arms, and each of those positions corresponded to a letter of the alphabet. And then a couple of kilometers away over here, you'd have somebody else in another semaphore tower with a spyglass or binoculars or something, and they could decode each of those positions of those wooden arms and write down the message. It was a really quick and efficient way of communicating over a distance. And rather than just having two semaphore towers, what if you had three, and then four, and then 10? You could very quickly create a chain of communication where short messages could be um, transposed from one end to the other in really pretty quick time. The first one of these came out of Paris, it ran for 240 kilometers, and the first message that was sent went down that chain of semaphore towers in about 35 minutes. Now, this was absolutely revolutionary in the 1790s. Previously, if you wanted a message to get from point A to B, you had to give it to somebody who had to get on a horse and ride for days and days, and it was expensive and it was time-consuming, very hard to scale that. And suddenly, they took this quantum leap in communication technology to find themselves able to send complex messages over great distances in no time at all. It was kind of the WhatsApp of the 18th century, just without memes and emojis. So, you've got a network of nodes with information and data passing back and forth through them over a whole country. That, to me, sounds an awful lot like the modern internet, doesn't it? And that's why I think this was the first ever internet. But where you've got data and information streaming back and forth through these semaphore towers, you've also, as we've explained, you've also got people who will want to hack that and make use of it. And so that's what happened. A couple of brothers called uh, Joseph and Francoise Blanc were bankers in Bordeaux, and much of the success of their business was based on whether or not the money markets in Paris had gone up that day or gone down that day. 
But the challenge was it took four or five days for the newspaper to arrive by horseback to them so that they could see what had happened. And they hit upon this idea. What if we could hack the semaphore network and hide a piece of information in an otherwise honest message that when it reaches us in Bordeaux will tell us whether the markets have gone up or down that day. We would have a huge competitive advantage. And it's what they did. They bribed somebody at the Paris end of the semaphore network to add just one extra letter to the end of a message. It might have been an X if the markets had gone up and a Y if it had gone down. That message traveled right the way down the country through these semaphore towers on the semaphore network. And they had another person on the payroll at the far end who took that message, had a look at whether it was an X or a Y, and thus whether the markets had gone up or down, got rid of it, handed the message over, and then told the Blanc brothers what had happened. And this ruse made them the equivalent of millions of dollars over years and years. They got away with it for ages. They became hugely wealthy, all on the basis of hacking this data network. It was kind of insider trading in the early 1800s. Now, when they were discovered, and they did eventually get fined out, as is so often the case, the law is a bit behind the modern technology of the day. And nobody could actually work out which law they'd broken, and so they got away with it scot-free and got to keep all the money, which is kind of amazing to think about, isn't it? But why is that early story of data hacking important? Well, for me, it's because I don't think the majority of cyber breaches, data hacking, call it what you want, I don't think they're a technical issue or an IT issue. I think they're a human issue. That's why we need to take responsibility for our own data. We need to be human firewalls protecting our own information. In that example, back in the early 1800s, it wasn't the network that was compromised, it was two people who were compromised. The people who were paid money at the start of that semaphore network and at the end to send that message. And that has ever been thus. It's exactly the same now with the majority of these incidents that we see. There's a certain type of data breach that in Australia, if it happens to your business, you have to report it to the government. And thousands of them are every year. They're called notifiable data breaches. And last year, about one in three of those had nothing to do with some malicious actor trying to access a server or a network. It was through human error and mistakes that people had made, clicking on a dodgy link in an email, downloading something they shouldn't have done, sending personal information to the wrong person. In fact, there's one instance last year of somebody sending a whole trove of personal information to the wrong fax number. Fax in 2021. I mean, it's almost as old as semaphore, isn't it? So, you've got I think this need for human beings, not the IT companies, not the tech companies, to take greater responsibility for their data. How do we do that? I think there are three things that we could all do as we leave today that would significantly improve our security and reduce the chance of you being one of those one in three people who are a victim of cybercrime. First is passwords. Who here uses the same password for everything? Oh, I feel ill. Oh, my goodness. OK, I understand why you do it. It's easy, it's simple. But let me tell you this. If you, if you, let's say, use 100 different websites with the same logon and the same password, if one of those is hacked through no fault of your own, the person who's hacked that website now has your logons for 99 other sites and apps and platforms. Imagine the trove of personal information that I could get if I accessed 100 websites that you visited and you've got accounts with. That's the real information that these guys want to build a profile of who you are. It helps them steal your digital identities. Most of you, about 80% of you, will have passwords that are seven or eight letters long. There'll be a single word with a capital letter at the start and a number and an exclamation mark or a hashtag at the end. They are too simple, those passwords. They take a cyber criminal about seven minutes to hack. My advice? will be to get something called a password manager that you can have on your phone or on your computer. And these are apps that create and store complex, random passwords that you can then use for every site you go to. It adds four or five seconds to the login process, but believe me, that is a lot less time than you having to reset 99 websites because your password's been hacked. Number two, second thing we can do. 
accept multi-factor authentication. So do you know what this is? This is when a, a website that you're trying to log into asks if it can send you a code to complete the login process. And this is probably the single most um, successful thing you can do to make yourself more secure online. The reason being, even if somebody has stolen your email address and your password, the chances of them also having access to your mobile phone are pretty small. So you kind of cut them off at the knees at that point, and uh, you're much more likely to, to find yourself secure as a result of that. Now, the third thing is a little more nebulous, and it's something that develops over time. We need to develop a sort of digital radar, like a kind of smell test for when we see a digital communication as to whether it's genuine or not. Is Tom Cruise really advertising cryptocurrencies on Instagram to you? Probably not. Can you really make $5,000 a day by staying at home? Probably not. And what about that email I showed you earlier? Well, let's take another look at that, because there are some really interesting hints that we can um, pick up from it. The first is the way that the email is phrased. Actually, I'll tell you the first thing is that the, the real red flag for me was that I'm not actually, um, I don't actually have a bank account with this, with this bank. So pretty quickly, I knew that this was a scam. But there will be people who will receive this who do. So how do you, how do you know? The first thing here is, dear valued member, that doesn't sound like I'm a member who's valued particularly, does it? <laughs> Banks will use your name, and they'll probably use the last four digits of your bank account code as well, your bank account number as well, which gives you confidence that this is an email that is meant just for you. So anything that starts sort of anonymously or without knowing who you are, that should be a little red flag. We recently have determined that different computers... Now, we recently have determined is... There's something that doesn't feel quite right about that word structure to me. It's, it's unnecessarily complicated or formal, it's a bit highfalutin, and that's often a hallmark of a, um, a cyber scam because it's often not written by someone who, for whom English is their first language. So that's a little red flag for me, as is the fact that they've capitalized the word account in the middle of a sentence. I don't think Bankwest would normally do that. Multiple password failures were present before this logon. Multiple password failures. Again, it's that very formal, slightly unnatural way of writing. It's also totally illogical. <laughs> How were passwords incorrect before somebody had logged on? And then there's a space between the S and the full stop at the end of, the end of that sentence. These are just little red flags, right? The punctuation is not great. We now need you to reconfirm your account information to us. No bank will ask you for your login and your password outright. They have processes that let you input that information without actually handing it over. But the fact that it's got two us at the end of the sentence, is, again, feels a little unnatural in the writing. They've given me a date by which I have to do this, otherwise they will be forced to suspend my credit card. Any uh, message that you receive that has um, a sense of urgency about it, where there's a date stamp about it, which if you don't don't do something by a particular date, should be a definite red flag. This also suggests that they're quite happy to let this go on for the next few days until I do sort it out, even though they think there's fraud happening. They spelt the word indefinitely incorrectly. <laughs> it's a bit of a red flag. And again, here's this highfalutin, very formal language, fraudulent purposes. So that all these things taken together should give you a sense that something's not quite right about that email, and it's probably a scam, which that one absolutely was. So those are the three things that we can take away with us today to become um, more responsible and to own our personal information, to help us become human firewalls so that we won't become one of those one in three people who will be the victim of cybercrime at some point in our lives. So it only remains for me to say, T, H, A, N, K, S. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>